just remember, there's a special place in hell for women who don't help each other. In the culture war, there are no winners, just podcasters. Only a few are willing to risk their lives in the face of some of the dumbest ideas to have ever captured human civilization. Every week, we, Megan Daum and Sarah Hader, humbly accept this mission in order to bring you conversations that are equal parts stunning, brave, and unhinged. Welcome to a special place in hell. Welcome, Sarah. Welcome, Megan. Uh, Could I'm we be hell. welcoming each other? I know. I'm oh. in hell right now because I am in New York. Yeah, that's uh, definitely my idea of hell. I know. You hate New York. I don't hate it. I don't hate I, it. I just don't like it. I just don't like it. I keep thinking about you. Um, Doesn't it make you feel you dirty? You don't you feel like you need to take a shower all the time when you're there? Yeah. That's how I feel. It's funny. Okay. Last night I washed my feet before getting into bed which is oh, not something ew. I would uh, ever do. Yeah, it's gross. Because it's just, because they get disgusting. Yeah, I'm back. Uh, I'm in my apartment for a few days here and I had a very interesting conversation with my neighbors last night. So mm. uh, this is pretty, pretty mixed neighborhood, but um, you know, a lot of nice white liberals hanging around. And we got into a conversation about Jordan Neely, the guy who was... Uh, killed in the, in the strangle and the choke hold on the subway last month. Uh, and one of my neighbors said that n- less than a week before that incident, she had been on the subway and Jordan Neely was in the car, in the subway car, really? doing exactly the same things, being very threatening, uh, getting up in people's faces, obviously psychotic um, talking to himself, but like a serious threat to the point that she came home and like told her son about it. And was, this was something that she was talking about a very scary subway ride for her. And then what do you know, a week later, this shows up in the, in the news. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Uh, I, what, how do they feel about this? Like how, how do they feel about what happened? They're, t- they're totally fed up. Mm. Um, they're, they cannot. So another neighbor, he takes pictures of people he sees on the street. You know, they do things like now they're trying to text 911 to report things that they see. There are people sleeping on the subway, but they don't even look like they're sleeping. I mean, one neighbor was like showing me a picture. He's like, is this a corpse? Like, is this somebody (laughs) passed out? Is this some, a person sleeping or is this a person who's dead? And uh, they are really frustrated by the fact that all of the press coverage has focused on this Marine Mm -hmm. who is a white guy who obviously uh, it was overkill and he should not have done what he did the way he did it. Obviously, he didn't mean to kill Jordan Neely, but I don't think the guy was I think he's (laughs) look, he did not act appropriately. Let's put it that way. But the fact is that there were at least two other people holding Jordan Neely down while this was going on. And neither of those people was white. Yeah. And they've both been memory hold. It, all of the reports talk about the fact that Jordan Neely was black. Um, uh, Daniel Penny, the, the Marine, was white. And that there were two other passengers holding him down. And then it just moves on to the next paragraph. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, that's all that's relevant to the to the narrative. That's why they don't include it. And the rest of the the other the other bits and pieces just complicate things. Um and it makes me just feel very like I just feel I have a very cynical uh you know view now of what we see and hear about stories like this. So my my tendency is just not to believe it. <laughs> At first, like whatever it is that it, the, the first narrative that comes, I just don't really believe it. And then I wait a couple of weeks to see what actually happens. And it's funny because people don't, people really, really get angry at you when in the heat of things, like when it first comes out, oh, this thing happened. And you try to say, hey, let's just, let's just wait. Right. Let's just wait. Let's you're just the, wait a few you're weeks. You're the whoa, 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 wait yeah. <laughs> a minute guy. 
Yeah, people hate that guy. Um, and the people that the people that hate him most, or her in this case most, are the ones who are benefiting, profiting from, like whose politics are profiting from what just happened. Um, and they don't, they really don't want to hear it. And I, I found now that if I, if I do this publicly, if I do this, if I go on Twitter, something has happened and I say, let's not jump to conclusions. Let's just wait. Let's just wait a couple of weeks and we'll find out. Um, I will just get like ripped to shreds. I don't see how anybody can do anything else at this point. I I become suspicious of everything I read and I hate it about myself. I mean, even something just mundane. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I I think it is a rational perspective though. It is the rational way to proceed. Uh, yeah. And it's interesting because it reminds me of something like it's just it's just so dystopian almost in in the, the, the just the level of distrust that normal people have that people who are very educated about the news have everybody seems to have. I had um uh, a nanny once like a part time nanny um who is from the Soviet Union or her like, family was from Russia and she was not from Russia but I think. Ukraine. Um, but in any case, uh, she was a recent immigrant to the United States. And I remember talking to her a little bit about what's going on in Ukraine and Russia. And she just, she just said, I don't believe what's in the news at all. They're all lies all the time. (laughs) I was like, what do you, what do you mean? Like, you don't believe that something is happening. And she's like, I don't believe any of it. It's all lies. Hmm. They're always lying. It was just level. It was a level of skepticism that even I don't have, you know, I don't, I don't think they're completely making things up. I think they might lie by omission. Um, I think they, they twist the narrative around. I don't believe it's not as if I don't believe any of it, but she doesn't believe any of it. And it, I've seen that kind of, um, attitude among people from very authoritarian countries. They just don't believe anything they hear. Yeah. Um, on the news media. And I think that's, it's, it's really fascinating and it says something spooky about what's going on with us and why we really need to turn things around very quickly. Well, good luck with that. I, I just, I, it's really, it's so interesting reading the comments too, because I've read a lot of coverage of this subway case and I, almost every, there's such a disconnect between whoever's writing the article and the reader comments. And there's also a disconnect between the reader comments, the people who live in New York city and the people who don't. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there, in this case, there is a complete lack of understanding of what actually is going on. Like, we're not just talking about somebody who is like mentally ill or talking to themselves Mm -hmm. or even even masturbating on the subway. Like nobody's going to go up thing. to that person. And, even, even that, like <laughs> no one is going to go up to that person and bother that person. But uh, there are routinely situations where people are um, making overt threats. Yeah. And I don't think people understand that. Mm-hmm. And the fact is that like everybody hates it. And frankly, nobody hates it more than working class black and Latino people who are riding the subway more than anybody with, with their, their kids. family. Yeah. yeah. With their kids. Yeah. Can you imagine you have to take the kids to the subway? I would. Well, I mean, a lot of people take their kids to the subway. Right. I mean, right. But like, so, you, but yeah. you would have to be on high alert because you're not just paying attention to what's going on and taking care of yeah. the needs of the child, but like making sure the kid doesn't brush too brush up too closely to the masturbating guy. I mean, it's, it's yeah. And so there were protesters, uh, and they were out there saying, um, I guess, so, so Daniel Penny has been now indicted on for second degree manslaughter. So there were protesters out there saying that's not enough. And every person on that subway car should be arrested for not, what? for not stopping this from happening. It's like, wait a second, guys, pick a lane, because I thought you were like against the carceral system, which, which is it? Um, before the carceral system for white people, but most of the people on that car were not white. Yeah. Uh, I don't think those protesters know that. Like, I don't think they're thinking, but they have to, because those protesters do take the subway. They're spiritually white. I I don't. Yeah. It's so insulting. Yeah. The the idea that we are not going to treat this like a normal story 
because of the racial makeup of the perpetrator, this no, the the so-called perpetrator and the victim. I, I just how if I if I were a black person, I would be livid, and I would be so offended. Mm-hmm. I think many of them are. I think yeah. that's why we're seeing these this small but significant shift to the right um, among black and brown people, like like black people, like African American black people, and mm-hmm. and Latinos. And we're seeing this shift happen. It's small, but yeah. it's telling. Because they have so much incentive not to vote that way, so when they're pulling up, pulling away from what yeah. is, you know, the path set out for them, it should tell us a lot about what they're really seeing out in, you know, their world. Um, but I don't know if anyone's listening. <laughs> you know, I think they're not going to listen until it's too late, until it's too I mean, obvious. It's a, uh, yeah, I mean, I remember years ago. Uh, I mean, I don't know, maybe four years ago. So de Blasio was in office by now. And uh, there was a guy going crazy on the train. And this older black woman I was sitting next to, she just shook her head and she said, I miss Michael Bloomberg. Bring him back. (laughs) (laughs) And I think that was true for a lot of people, even despite what happened to the, you know, economy and nobody can afford an apartment anymore. It's, it's really, yeah. I don't. So you miss I, the I, I city. You're you're mm-hmm. happy to be back. You're happy to see it again. I'm, I'm you, happy to be back. Feel? Yeah. What? How do you feel like when you come back to the city? Well, you like... I love my apartment. So okay. I mean, my apartment is is usually rented. It's just it's it's not at the moment. So I'm always okay. so happy to come back to my apartment. Uh, Why didn't you stay in your apartment? Because I do you can't. Rent it? It's very small. It's okay. a it's a pied de terre. It oh, it's because be. it's because of Hugo. <laughs> well. It should not be occupied. It's like it's a perfect <laughs> pied de terre. It should not I don't be know occupied what that means. Anybody. Stop using foreign languages, it's, Sarah. This you're is, such a philistine. Yeah, I like mean, a little. It's like a little, little, little. There's a little bit. Of, there's the a little bit of French. Just it's just okay, a little place yeah. where you go if you have another place. Okay, that's what it should be. All right. Um, but it's beautiful. It has this incredible view, and I love it. And I love my neighbors. And I love my building. I just. Uh, I like living in California. You know, I realize that like what what a lot of what some people are with like having commitment problems and not being able to choose a partner or like constantly, you know, dating, like unable to make a relationship commitment. I have that with locations. Mm. I apartments. cannot make a, a commitment between California and New York. Like I'm just like constitutionally incapable of it. Why? What? So what does California have? I love the, I love the air. I love the light. I love that it's like, Mm -hmm. you know, it can be outside. You can be in the country, in the city. You can be like, you can be very close to downtown and still Mm -hmm. there's coyotes everywhere and owls and, you know, bobcats. So bobcats. Yeah. Yeah. I can do without the bobcats. Um, um, parts of Texas are like mountain that. lions. Austin's kind of like that. You're not too far away from like, you know, the kind of places where you would get shot if you, you know, cross the wrong fence. Oh, in Texas, you mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm going to Texas uh, in a couple of days. Oh, right. Right. Yeah. For a uh, yeah, I'm gonna go. Are you are you announcing it? Are we announcing it? Can well, it's I can say it's okay. a private. It's a well. So I'm going to Dallas uh, to be on in a panel discussion at uh, for the University of Austin. They have their forbidden courses session uh, over these next few weeks, and rather confusingly, they are having this in Dallas, mm. even though it's the University of Austin. So I'm gonna be on a little panel there with Nancy Rommelman and Sarah Heppola. Not you. And um, we'll miss you. We're going to be talking. I don't know. We, the, the students have, have submitted questions that are like really, really good questions. It's a private event. So I probably shouldn't say much more about it, but maybe yeah. I'll report back after it happens. Yeah. yeah. I think you should have recruited like another like minority. Just to break oh, it up. Oh, yeah. Just yeah, to be I think like, it's going to be like a lot of white women. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's going to be a lot of white men. 
Oh, oh, oh you mean on the panel? Of, on the yeah. panel. Well, a lot of white men in the audience and then a yes. lot of white women. Well, maybe that'll work. Maybe no I, one's going to complain. <laughs> I should have asked Sarah, Sarah Rao to uh, oh, stand in for you. Oh, she would have been you. great. Oh, yeah. Actually. Maybe she, I think she would have done it because she's that kind of person, I think. I think she likes a fight. Mm-hmm. And you should have been like, this is the perfect opportunity. Yeah. It's going to be, and you could make it be, you could have even had a table instead of a panel, you know, like stage. You just have like a little mini dinner table. And oh, everybody else I see. Just oh, watches. right. We can reenact <laughs> a race to dinner. A race to dinner. For the set. students of the University mm-hmm. of Austin. Right. That, and they're take, taking notes and it's like, yes. in a, yeah. It would be like immersive theater. Uh-huh. Performance. Yeah. I can see it. I think it would be great. Yeah. Uh, anyway, well, hopefully no one will get shot for going on the wrong property, but that is happening. Uh, and then there's an unspeakeasy in Austin after that. But I will report back on my Texas trip the next mm-hmm. time we convene. Cool. Um, anyway, so, yeah, I don't know if I had more to say on the on the on the homeless thing. Actually, no, I do. Another thing that one of my neighbors was observing was that there's this thing that happens with these guys on the subway, especially when they're black. They're not all black. They often are. John McWhorter actually had a really good uh, piece in, in the New York Times about this. He's really the only person who's written about this with any degree of clarity or honesty. But um, so like the these black guys will get up in your face and sometimes they'll start saying things like, you don't acknowledge me. You don't see me. You, you, and it's like, as if they're weaving this kind of social justice coded language into their rantings (laughs) and it's not conscious, I'm sure, Mm -hmm. but it's like, they've absorbed this in the air the same way they absorb uh, like, you know, racist messages going around yelling anti-Asian epithets. It's because it's seeped into their consciousness somehow because it's so much in the air. And so they're using these kind of, um, this kind of like very, this, 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 they're, they're sort of insinuating that if you don't interact with them, you are a racist and they're doing that to a lot of white people on the subway. They harass everybody, by the way, but this is a particular thing that they do to white people. So one of my neighbors said that he saw a guy start to do a kind of like Bojangles, like minstrel show kind of dance in front of him as a way of trying to get, you know, my neighbor, the passenger to like acknowledge this guy's presence. And it's just very interesting. And, you know, I, I you wonder how conscious they are of it because any given, any number of people could be taking a video at that moment. Mm-hmm. Like all we need is for some white subway passenger to say something to a black, uh, yeah. quote unquote yeah. performer. Yeah. Uh, and then yeah. that will go viral. It's just, oh, it's so, it's such a shit storm. That's really interesting. What you're saying though, about just them absorbing it. You know, I think, we talk a lot on this podcast about norms and stories and like what 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 is you know the natural the the national you know story that what is what is it what is a narrative that Americans are telling themselves about themselves um and it's so interesting that the way that a large percentage of our population, you know, and it, I, I don't, I don't mean to say majority because I don't know the numbers, but it just seems like a significant percentage looks at America, the country that they're in, looks at their fellow Americans as oppressors, looks at the history of their country as necessarily a, a, an evil one. And perhaps it might be getting slightly less evil, but not, not fast enough. And some will say that it hasn't gotten less evil. Um, and it's, it's, it's fascinating. And it says something, I keep saying, I keep saying the same thing. I keep saying this says something about us, it, 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 but it does, you know? Um, and I don't know if it, there are parallels to other countries. You know, I, I don't know that Pakistanis, for example, go around hating on Pakistan and it's, mm. you know, it's history and it's culture. I think the exact opposite happens. I think, you know, e- even when I came as a child from Pakistan to to the United States, I think I was like 
an extreme kind of nationalist <laughs> um, when it for came the to the United Pakistan. States or for, for Pakistan. For pa- for, uh-huh. Yeah. I, Sorry, Pakistan. Sorry, um, I Pakistan. Should, I should, uh, if I sorry, say I, it like you do, that sounds like I'm culturally appropriating I the say pronunciation. It like I, I say it in the way that the last person I was talking to said it. So I was talking to my mom. So I'm saying Pakistan. But if I was just so talking you to always you, say Pakistan. Pakistan. I do. You always sometimes say I say that. Pakistan. I think I switch but back and forth. Is if I was to say Pakistan, that would be obnoxious, right? So I say Barack Pakistan. Obama did it and he did it. He did a great job. His pronunciation was exactly perfect. It was really good. I was impressed the first time I heard him say it because he's been to Pakistan. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, he had like well, of course. some Pakistani friends he's he used to do. Probably hiding. Whatever. He was, had a yeah. you know, sleeper cell there. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. right. Um, uh, uh, well, well, anyway, I was a nationalist. Okay. I was a nationalist when I when I came here. I remember um, fighting with my American cousins about things, about how. Pakistan was so much better in so many, so many ways. I think maybe I was, I had a strong sense of like inferiority. Wait, when you were like seven years old? Right. So it's hard to, (laughs) it's hard for me to put myself back in those shoes, but I do remember a little bit of what happened. I remember that I felt that Pakistan was an amazing country, um, that we had been like America stole a bunch of things from us and who knows what exactly, but I just had this strong sense of like injustice to when it came to the United States. Um, but I had just a very, very powerful, like almost nationalist, uh, like feeling that was like deeply rooted. And I can't remember one piece of propaganda that, that that was a cause of that i think it was just like the national this is just was was in the air in pakistan you just were hyper nationalist Mm. um and that was just kind of the norm i think that might be the norm in a lot of places you know i think a lot of like i think it's not just authoritarian countries like china i think it's this is more often what happens in countries that they have this strong sense of uh national pride of pride in their country, of pride in their history and what they've accomplished together. And it, like to the extent that it would seem distasteful and nationalist uh, in the United States. Um, and certainly it's not replicated in the United States or maybe anywhere in the West. So anyway, I think, I'm sure there's studies of this. I should look this up and then we can talk about it in detail next time. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, anyway, that's that. Yeah. Uh, so there's, <clears throat> oh, we should remind people, uh, if you're enjoying this podcast, please rate us and review us wherever you're getting this podcast from. If you're on YouTube, do the thumbs up thing, subscribe, all of these things help us a lot. Um, and if you really like what you're listening to and want to get more want to get the bonus segment which we have at the end of every episode we have like you know a good 20 it's 15 so 20 long. minutes sometimes, it's too, i feel it's like sometimes so, it's longer sometimes than it's the long. actual podcast well, that's definitely that's um alternative facts from from megan but it it it, it definitely is feels like it. it it feels like it that's for sure um no but you you will enjoy the bonus it's more lighthearted. it's sometimes spicier uh we really um let our hair down on the bonus and you can get to that if you go to i don't because uh, my hair doesn't come megan's down any further, yeah it doesn't but, this is just the way yeah. it is her hers is frozen like this it is. um if you go to a special place dot substack.com you can subscribe there and then you can get the bonus uh which is at the moment still uh still only audio right megan is that the case yes although yes. i think uh um, we're changing that we're soon. moving to uh to change full that. video yeah yeah so, so for um, now um but you definitely get it and uh it's exciting and you get access to the commentary community on substack as well and you can tell us off there which is people enjoy it all the yeah. time too um, much and if you are a founding member we have uh, a couple of hangouts coming up on on the zoom so uh on the zoom on like the that. zoom i like the way you say yeah on, so. on the zoom on the youtubes on the YouTube, yeah, but yeah. on the Zooms, we're gonna be on uh, uh, on camera, and we have a we always have a nice conversation uh, with, with with, and sometimes uh, sometimes we last time we got I feel like we got a telling off because we did Penelope Penelope Trunk had 
just been on, right? Oh, or was that the time before or last time? I don't know. A while was, ago. So yeah. Was, so but, there was yeah. one of them where we got we people were just like, oh, I we I can't believe it. Yeah. Um, but we can tell people that the first one is going to be on uh, Tuesday, June twenty seventh mm-hmm. at seven p.m. Eastern time. Yeah. And then there will be another one on Saturday, July twenty second at seven p.m. Eastern time. So. Be a founding member and we will see you there. Okay. Right. Um, So there was a really interesting um, chart going around on Twitter um, from a, an Atlantic article. Um, It's called new political polarization. Now, now political polarization comes for marriage prospects. This is bad news for marriage. Um, And they talk about the, you know, they talk about a lot of things. Um, but the chart that was, that I found very interesting, uh, was one that, uh, was focusing on singles ages 18 to 30, uh, and from 1972 to 2022. Um, so a, a long span of time. Um, I think they, 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 pool data across five years intervals in order to ensure a large enough sample to see how attitudes in early adulthood have shifted over time. And uh, there was a chart, the chart that was um, really fascinating was one that just showed and post Trump political landscape, young single men have been moving to the right, even as their female peers have been moving even further left. About 10% of such men were conservative in the early 1980s, but that share has now risen to about 15%, uh, while the proportion of single, single liberal young men has held steady at about 18%. As for single young women, the share identifying as liberal surged from about 15% in the, ni- in the early 1980s to 32% in the 2020s. That's crazy. Um, mm-hmm. Correspondingly, the share of conservative single women declined from 10% to about 7% in the same period. So what's going on? Um, well, I have a couple of theories. Okay. But Shoot. I mean, off the top of my head, I would say it correlates with education, right? So if you mm. have more women going to college, they are going to become more left-leaning from because of that experience. So there would be that. And the opposite is happening to the men? Um yeah, I mean, I guess if they're not if 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 I don't are fewer men going to college or is it just that more women are going? Hmm. There, I, I think also, it might be both. Yeah. A little yeah, bit. Yeah. And but it wouldn't okay. explain how intense of a shift I, I don't think you would exp- explain the intensity, but yes, you're right. I think, I think, I think that's, is, a, that's part, part of it. For sure. And then I would have to imagine that the rise of podcasting and independent media and social media, YouTube, the manosphere, the emergence of that kind of like marketplace of ideas mm-hmm. has, has had a huge effect. I bet YouTube actually is a major player in this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, uh, so the article goes on and talks about how this poses a major, again, I'm reading directly from it, this poses a major challenge for people looking to marry, given that many of young, today's young adults show a growing preference for partnering with someone who shares their politics. I sort of feel like um, they're, they're getting it twisted a little bit. I think the reason we didn't see this intense of a gender or sex polarization in the seven, in the late seventies, um, uh, or, or between really the night, the 1980s to, to when it starts sort of, um, separating a lot more in the, in the two thousands and then early 2010s is because people aren't marrying, you know, I think marriage forcing young men and young women to come together, which is what marriage does, like working together on the same team. I think it, it tempers the ideological, I guess, instincts of both sexes a little bit. Is it marriage and, or ha- or or family? Is it marriage or children? I think it's probably both. I think well, it's, also, I think does something, and then children children intensifies that effect. I mean, also when you get married, you get a tax break. 
So you start sure. thinking more along <laughs> I don't those think, lines. I don't know people are think necessarily thinking that. I but remember I think- when I got married, I was like, whoa, this is amazing. <laughs> Well, I mean, just spending time though with a, just having a, a relationship, just having a, a, a romantic relationship with the opposite sex, seeing their perspective, talking to them all the time, you become closer in ideologies, wherever, regardless of where you started, you become a little bit closer. Um, but I think, yeah, family has a lot to do with it. I think what we're seeing here, especially with the female single liberals, um, sort of shooting away like this, um, is is that i mean the the interesting thing about this chart is that it only ever measures single people you know so these are always people who are not mothers and not family like they're not they're not mothers wait are they specifically not mothers we're we're presuming they're not we're presuming they're not single mothers they could be but i mean there's a good chance they are oh you think if you're single yeah i mean given the well this is 18 to 30 this is 18 to 30 single people so i think it's okay it's fair enough yeah fair to assume that they're probably not mothers and if they are mothers are married um okay but maybe 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 you're right that maybe it's not a huge but but what i find it's interesting they're definitely not married this whole time and yet they were much closer in uh in ideologies of two sexes even while they were single, like single people, single, single, single women and single men were much closer. We're seeing eye to eye in politics in the 1980s in the way that they are not seeing eye to eye anymore. So what's mm-hmm. what's specifically happening to the singles? Um, well, I don't know. What do you think? Um, I do think that there's there has been a shift instead of like presuming that the shift is happening with, with the, with there's something happening in, in that demographic, I think the explanatory, what makes, what makes sense to me is that what counts for liberal and what counts for conservative has changed. You know, that liberalism has changed, conservatism has changed, and they have both become more aligned with the tendencies of one sex or the other. Um, And I think that Definitely, it is the case that modern progressivism, I'm using the words liberal and progressive interchangeably, which definitely pisses some people off a lot, but just bear with me here. We're being, we're being loose with the definitions. Uh, but whatever it is that, that progressivism was 30 years ago is not what progressivism is today. And I think that the, the progressivism of today is less appealing to, to men and far more appealing to women, just psychologically. Mm-hmm. What would you say about that? You know, like this, there's this empathy oriented, you know, save the poor brown people, you know, the, the, I, I feel like yeah. it, it harnesses a female energy or activates, you know, certain underlying predisp- predispositions in women very well. Yes. Yes. Well, that is a concept that I'm fascinated by. And I definitely want to drill down on that. But as you're talking, I'm thinking about like the baby boomers, thinking Mm. about the hippie movement, Mm. sexual revolution. I'm wondering if, if part of, if the sexual revolution was interesting to men for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. So maybe there was some kind of incentive to align politically Mm. with whatever Mm. that represented Mm -hmm. so like you were you were either on the cool side you were on the cool team you were you were a hippie you were groovy you were like you know moving past the Mad Men era Mm -hmm. or you were a square Mm -hmm. and that wasn't necessarily gendered Mm -hmm. and so maybe now that we're post the sexual revolution we're kind of fighting over the scraps Mm -hmm. uh and it may be that, as we've said many times, the sexual revolution has benefited men. And so they're sort of all taken care of now. And mm-hmm. the women are kind of, um, they're just sort of, they're, they're, they're angry and distressed in a kind of ambient way. Mm-hmm. And that gets channeled into activist progressive causes that may or may not have anything to do with their actual problems. Or reality, right. for that matter. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I, I think it, it might it might also be that the kind of just piggybacking on what you're saying, the kind of woman that is now single is different than the kind of woman that was single 40 years ago. Mm. You know, I think it could have been more of a political statement and a better fit for one's personality. You know, like if, if you're making that, if you're making the choice to be single at 28 uh, in the 1980s, I think you're a, you're one kind of woman because you're really pushing back against the expected norms of marriage and like, like family formation Mm -hmm. at that age. So you're pushing back on it for either because you're getting highly educated or you're really choosing this as this is not the lifestyle for you. Or you're like, maybe you're extremely homely or something and no one wants you. I don't know. <laughs> <But> it's <laughs> it's either that's, that's deliberate that's, or you're it, just not hot enough. It's, it's, I mean, I'm sure that happens to some percentage of, of women, yeah. but, but there's, right. It was a different kind of woman, but now so many women um, who would have been married 40 years ago, 30 years ago, 20 years ago are not married at 28. So I think that you have a lot more, uh, normie women, you know, women who would have, who, who really would have just fallen into whatever the social norm was right, in right. the, in the nineties who are now falling into a different social norm. And for some reason, this is this, the same, these same forces are working to polarize them politically. Right. I guess the question is what about conservatism, conservatism, is not serving them in their minds. Like, is it, is it about abortion? Mm. Is it about like, I don't, I mean, I'm trying to think like, if you are your average, like single 28 year old woman, Uh how, how are your values going to be necessarily different than a 28 year old married woman? I mean, maybe the married woman isn't as concerned about access to abortion, let's just say. Uh, so Do you really think abortion drives people so much? I think they, it, I, um, I think a lot of, yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's a big, big deal. It's a huge touchstone. And I think there, there are definitely like women who are effectively single issue voters, mm-hmm. um, and they will die on that hill mm. understandably actually. So, but I'm trying to think like, if you are, okay, let's just say like the sex in the city ladies. I know this is a pretty dated reference at this point, but I think it's actually pretty legible. Okay. So like, what about their lives? What is going to motivate them to vote for progressive candidates? I I think it's status. It's social contagion, really. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, yeah. I think it's social. It's just, it's just, those women are going to vote for progressives because they're just going to pick that up from their brunch friends. And they're going to feel that this is the right thing to do. This is the, the way uh, an educated person behaves in their circles. And then that's what they're going to do. So, but but what has, um, what has fostered this sense that this is the high status opinion among women um or even just maybe not even high status maybe just this is the the it's kind correct. it's this the is, morally yeah, it's correct morally correct right compassionate yeah. you know kind good because you're caring opinion. about people who ha- are disadvantaged you're yeah. caring about other humans yeah 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 i think that goes back to what I was saying earlier about this is just, there's just something about the disposition of women that, that modern progressivism really hits, you know, it hits all the right notes. Yeah. And I think it's less of what does conservatism, how has conservatism changed and more of like, we said that's, that's a discussion everywhere that this is the Trump effect, but it's really, if you look at this chart anyway, it started before Trump. Yeah. Um, this was happening. It's been happening for some time. And I think the, the real uh, factor behind it is that the political ideologies have changed um, and they're changing in a way that really satisfies certain, um, certain tendencies among, among women anyway. And so I think it's going to be very hard for them to move away from that uh, into an ideology that says, okay, no, we, 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 we like hierarchies. We like, um, you know, we think some people are smarter and better than others and they should, they deserve better in life. Like I mean, there's, it's a, mm-hmm. there's a very like competitive and dog eat dog, dog eat, 
eats dog Yeah, well, I mean, it's just fact-based. Kind of. Like, just because something, it, just because some, we don't like something doesn't mean that it's not true. Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, yeah, I, I had Diana Fleischman, the evolutionary psychologist on The Unspeakable this week. And she talked a lot about this, just women, you know, these personality traits, women being scoring higher and neuroticism mm. or openness, that kind mm-hmm. of thing. Um, and, you know, it, it, I'm thinking of uh, Adam Carolla's book, which was called In 50 Years, We'll All Be Chicks. And I think that, that was published <laughs> right. like 10 years ago already. And oh, I sure. do, I think I, like the culture is becoming feminized. Right. Clearly. Right. And is that because women are taking over the world because women are in positions of power? I think so. They've been elevated for good reason. Yeah. Um, But also like the world is automated. We don't need manual labor. I mean, we've been over all this before. Right, right. Um, And I think, so there's there's a chicken and egg thing going on. Yeah. um, That it is the case that these women are reacting to a different political, like a, a different kind of progressivism that meets their needs better. And it's also the case that they are creating that progressivism, you know, by, by becoming more empowered in their communities, in their world, in their political circles, in uh, leadership positions, in organizations and associations, and just the, the institutional, the institutions that we rely on to, to create our culture and that, that have a a powerful effect on on creating our you know political ideologies women are taking you know they're they're there they're at the table mm-hmm. and i think that the 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 morph that we're seeing has a lot to do with that too and i wonder what that has to say i said this a little bit in uh while i was on josh zepp's podcast um uh which everyone should look up he's so it, great He's so great. I'm so glad you went on it. He's, he's phenomenal. He's so funny and so quick on his feet. It's actually like, like a little tough, you know, as, (laughs) as somebody who's goes there to just, you know, I'm a, I'm a guest, please just accept what I say (laughs) without question. And and congratulate me for being so smart. And he's not going to do that Um, but you know, it's, it's super fun. Um, he's, I think he's great. He's one of the, like, I think he's one of the better, interviewers out there um in yeah. terms of being able to keep a conversation both interesting and lighthearted but at the same time like deep actually <laughs> you know get yeah no he's, right in he's into the genuinely part. smart i think he's yeah. very, a very deep thinker yeah by the way this is the uncomfortable conversations podcast yes, with yes, josh I Zepps, who's with an australian broadcaster and podcaster yes um, and yes. he's also a great uh monologist or monologuer is, when he does like solo episodes monologist that's how you say monologuer really? yeah monologist. okay just okay um or maybe it's like a doctor it's like huh. oh i need can anybody recommend a, a monologist <laughs> monologist I, I i that's what i have it, this i immediately ailment. thought yeah some kind of disease like, like if a you monologist can't shut up, if you can't stop talking you, go to, you need to see a monologist this is our problem we need yeah, to go see uh, no uh, anyway, he's, he's anyway great. he's great. So yeah, so he did he push back at you? What did he get mad? <laughs> he at you did. For? He did quite a bit. Well, we talked a lot about um, wokeism because I had republished on my Substack uh, a, a, a letter wiki conversation I had with Ayan Hirsi Ali, the the famous and uh, yeah, like fabulous uh, uh, ex Muslim who uh, has been a critic of Islam for for quite some time. Uh, and she was on the receiving end of some pretty serious death threats, uh, like a Salman Rushdie kind of situation. And uh, anyway, she, we, she and I had a uh, a back and forth uh, letter exchange on a website called Letter Wiki that is now defunct. I think it's been absorbed into Substack or the company has been absorbed into Substack or something. Uh, so the letters went down and they weren't available anymore. And they were so good. Um, and I found myself wanting to reference them a lot. Uh, cause in that, in those letters, I talked, I said, <laughs> wokeism has already won. I said, I said this, you know, it's already over. Uh, and, uh, Ayan was, was surprised and I guess maybe even a little bit disturbed at, at this, this, uh, claim of mine. So we went back and forth and discussed it. Um, wait, Ayan was disturbed by it. Ayan felt That's as if it's not okay. over. Yeah, she she thought, you know, that 
liberalism is strong and liberals are strong. And how long ago was this? This was in 2020. So okay. it wasn't forever ago, but yeah. it was, it, it was, at it was in the peak of, you know, George Floyd, you know, summer of love. Uh, right. That was 2020. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And I remember feeling very pessimistic at that time. I'm actually more pessimistic now about the state of it. I think I was right when it comes to the fact that it's all the, the war is already over because by the time we started seeing these like extremist, uh, uh, you know, fires erupt in important institutions the what we should have understood from that is that there's actually something really terrible going on and the rot is fairly deep and i think that i've been i think that i'm right about that unfortunately anyway so uh, we discussed those that letter exchange that i published on my substack um josh had a lot of things to say about it i was um uh, he pushed back on on my characterization of like coming back to this conversation he pushed back on my characterization of uh woke ideology or really what the the changes that we're seeing in our institutions as being less of an ideological shift but being uh a sh- due to a shift in demographics you know it, while we're talking about the chicken and egg i think i might lead lean lean more in the direction of well there are there used to be 10% you know women in some of these in let's say academia um teaching and now there are, you know, large percentage of women and it depends on the department, but some, mm-hmm. some, some fields are majority women by, by large margins, actually. Yeah. And I think that that has had, that is what's, what's really going on. And wokeism is just what's the, the, the politics that is most comfortable for women as opposed to men, you know? So I think we're, we're, we're brushing up against something that is uh, perhaps less flexible to argument, you know, less flexible to debate if it really is a, a psychological predisposition. Mm. Um, you know, it, it, Josh, the Josh pushed back against that and defended women a little bit which was very noble of him. I think this was in the bonus segment of his podcast. Anyway, listen to it. It was a very good conversation. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I, 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 what do you think about that? Like, what do you think about? I think, I, I think women, I don't know if women created so-called cancel culture, but I think we control it. And I have now come to think that only we can stop it. Would we stop it though? Well, again, I mean, this is why I started the unspeakeasy. Like we have so many women in there um, saying, I can't talk about this with my friends. The fact that they have to go into this private community to have completely logical conversations would tell you something. And so much of it, and I've said this many times, I don't think that women... So I don't think that the social penalties for speaking out are necessarily higher for women. Many would argue with me, but I think like actually the data would show that men get piled on just as much. It's just that women are more sensitive to it. We're more sensitive to it. They don't want it. people to be mad at us and we don't yeah. want to hurt people's feelings. Yeah. I think a lot of, a lot of issues women just won't bring up because it's not worth it. It's not mm-hmm. worth it. Their mm-hmm. friendships are more important than than getting this idea across. Yes, yes. Um, but which I, I, so I think is that, good. Would you say then, is, is your understanding that more, more women are like the kinds of women that attend your unspeakies or who listen to our podcast I, or are like us? You know, are there more who are actually like us that can change what's going on and that we're just not speaking out for some reason um, or speaking out enough? Or I, is the average woman different? Yeah, I think that there are enough that are either like us or normies. So why aren't we speaking out already? Well, if we're predisposed to speaking out, well, like why haven't predisposed- why, did, why did this problem why did it why did it ever get to this point? If there is always a, a significant percentage of women that would 
be strong enough to push back against this and would be willing to do it? Oh, well, I don't think it's, I think that all I'm saying, I, I think that there's like, it's probably in thirds, right? So a third of the women are true believers. Mm-hmm. A third of them are like us. And mm-hmm. a third are normies who don't care, who don't even think about it. So it's okay. two thirds against one third. I mean, mm. somebody said, um, uh, somebody was talking about uh, in the community, I don't think this is revealing too much, had gone into like an office or some kind of medical office or something and had to you know, check a pronoun box on the form or something. And there were like mm-hmm. a whole bunch of receptionists behind the desk, you know, like normal w- women. And the woman said, do I really have to check this box? And they sort of like all rolled their eyes and, (laughs) you know, and so you've got like a hot, you know, some kind of administrative body that has mandated this procedure and all the rank and file just being like, I don't know, whatever. So the problem I think is that because women have been seen as a protected class for so long we were not pushed back against by men. It was uncouth for a man to criticize the woman's movement, for instance, because it's like punching down. It's still the case. I think it's gotten worse. I think men are less likely to speak out against feminism or women's issues in general. You know, from that perspective, things are worse because I think- Well, because it can be, yeah, because they'll get a screen cap or- they get destroyed. Why like would that. a woman, why destroyed. would a man, why would a man even, I mean, if I was, if I was, a, if I was a man who wanted to discuss touchy subjects, I would be feeling very nervous about having a, f- like a female yeah. guest and pushing back on the female guest, right. especially when it came to women's issues or w- issues that are related to, to, you know, sex. Um, I would have, I, I would feel nervous about doing that. I would feel like I'm going to be immediately painted as a bad guy. And I don't want, I don't want that. Why, why yeah. ask for that? You know, why? That's, that's why I think women have to put a stop to it. It's kind of, unfortunately it just comes back to, well, I think that if you are a black person, you are in a much better position to speak up against the current sure. iteration of DEI stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but maybe just more generally, speaking up against a feelings-based culture, maybe that is the job of women because men are just going to sound like a bunch of Neanderthals if they do that. But like- I agree with you that women are the only people that can stop it. I think I disagree that we would. Okay. You know, I think that, I think that we, we led the charge. I think that it exists because the handmaidens are women. And I've been through, like personally, have been through a million- you know, of these mobs um, in my time as an activist. And I've seen so many, like outside of my personal space, like outside of my personal group, even, you know, organization after organization, I've seen so many people go through this over and over again. And it is always, it is women leading the charge. It is women with the pitchforks and it doesn't matter if the the target could be a man, the target could be a woman. Sometimes there's more hostility by the women to the other woman. Oh, if, if, definitely. if they're, if they're facing, yeah. If, if the, if the women are the person that's that, that is being targeted by the mob is a woman. Sometimes women are far more vicious towards that person, but I've, you know, the ringleaders of all these, of, of the mobs that I've seen almost, they're almost entirely women or majority women every time. And it's, you know, you can't just see this pattern again and again and again, and think that, well, this is the group that's going to stop it, you know, because this is the group where, where this is the group where the toxic people are coming from, you know. Um, and but what's when, a group? I mean, we're not a monolith. Fe- we're females. Fe- the, the group is females. It's coming from females. But it's coming from females behaving in a mean girl adolescent way. So I think there needs to be, I think there needs to be a revolution of adults. Because the, yeah, we need to have yeah. a sense that the adults have stepped into the room. Maybe the right, Gen X, I'm going to refine this a little bit. I'm just, Gen X will Gen step X up and change. Yeah, have, right. Gen X okay. women will have to step up because where we're have they actually, been? Where, where, well, why there weren't there very many of us? Up. No, but no, I, I, I disagree. I think Gen, Gen X people don't like, like, you let it all happen as far as I'm concerned, you know? So why, why didn't Gen Xers tell their millennial, you know, underlings in, in organizations that they're in to, 
shut up and get back to work or you're fired. You know, why, um, why did they l- allow themselves to be bullied? I think that millennials still had baby boomer bosses though, up until fairly recently. And the baby boomers were trying to be hip and cool. And I think the baby boomers were confusing whatever wokeness, whatever Mm -hmm. this kind of, this particular social justice movement with their own. Mm -hmm. And I think they were reluctant to say anything until it was too late. So you you think that Gen Xers are more likely to stand up and stop it? Um, Are they more likely to stand up against? Well, the problem is, is this now they know because they can't retire, they can't lose their jobs. I mean, I think it's like it really just comes down to very pragmatic issues of people trying to stay, survive mm-hmm. financially mm-hmm. And, right. and keep keep their jobs. Right. I wish that the baby boomers would step up right before they retire mm. uh, because then they could kind of slip in under the door. They could, you know, burn the place I think they down don't even know what's away. going on. Like <laughs> uh, so from the baby, from the baby boomers that I know, they don't know what's going on. Like the Gen Xers are more likely to see the problem mm-hmm. of, of wokeism and millennials definitely see it, or at least the, the, the heterodox based millennials are definitely see it. The baby boomers don't understand what's happening and they're giving their money to some of these institutions that, you know, are, yeah. are really foundational to keeping this thing going. Um, yeah, I don't, you know, I, I, I think you're right that the only people who really could stop it would be women. I am much, I, I, I think I just don't feel like we would and that we don't really, we need, the incentives need to be, need to be different than what they are. Because right now, as you just said, every individual's incentive is to pipe, like just shut up and mm-hmm. put their head down and take it. And out of the out of women and men, women are more likely to do that. You know, just that behavior. I see that in women, uh, normie women, right? Yeah. Um. So I don't know. I don't know what we do to break out of it. But the, I think the more interesting question is, what happens now that our institutions that the institutions that were developed under a very different uh, you know, environment. What happens now that they they are operating in a in a in a different ideology? And by that, let me like explain that a little bit. When we had you know, acad- we, we developed academia, like the modern university, like academic environment. This was it it it, it was born and bred at a time where the the average attendee and definitely the average instructor was male. And so you had, you know, a population that have that has a certain kind of uh, psychological bu- uh, predisposition, and they, you know, th- there was an evolution of, you know, let's let's have a meritocracy, let's have let's have open debate, let's have you know freedom of speech and academic freedom, and we'll find the truth. You had, you know, everybody was on the same page. That this is mm-hmm. a acad- academia is a truth seeking institution. Yes, now and there was a toughness a, to it. The, right, there was a sort right. of valence of like rigor and intellectual. Um, it was a battle. It was, it, it, it was yes. a it, you know it's a gauntlet. It was a ba- battle of the wits kind of thing. And so so many of these elite institutions were actually like it, it, they, they were really gauntlets, but of an intellectual class. You know, this is how an intellectual proved himself among his peers by rising to the top of such organizations or, or getting esteem. Yeah, debate in clubs these, and right, all that. Right, right. In these institutions. Societies. Yeah. That's not how these institutions are operating anymore because the, the people that are in them prefer another way to socialize with, you know, their colleagues and their peers. So this changes the extent to which they can do what they were founded to do. I don't think that academia is any longer an institution that can serve its ultimate purpose, which is to find truth. If it is also caring about how do people feel, to the extent that it cares about that at all, it is necessarily compromised in its ability to find truth. DEI in general, it needs to be rejected wholesale, not a little bit, entirely. Universities need to say, we do not, we cannot, we absolutely cannot value something else over 
you know, our ultimate, what is our ultimate mission, which is to find truth. And what helps having intelligent people who deserve to be there, who also care about um, finding truth. So this matters. This matters a lot. Um, it matters a lot that we we don't care about offending people when we search for the truth. It matters a lot that we are open in our process, uh, that we are we have open debate and an atmosphere of, you can say what you want, so long as it's right, so long as it's correct. You know, I mean, well, who's that's to what, say what's correct? But look, but that's what, how will we find out? By, by openly debating, right? The problem now is that they have already decided what's correct. Okay, but would you say that there has been no use for this kind of DEI, intersectional awareness, whatever you want to call it, as a corrective? Has there, have there been no gains? It is applied wrongly in these institutions. It does not belong in these institutions. If we want to correct for injustices that we have, you know, that, that, that the government, the society, whatever has put upon a certain group of people, it needs to be addressed in different aspects of our society and our life. You know, so we can, we can talk about, uh, how do we educate people in K through 12? We can talk about, you know, differences, ch- changes that we can make at different segments of, you know, a person's life or in their, mm-hmm. in, in society and address it in that way. When we allow this to creep in into the institution that has a mission, we will necessarily compromise that mission. You know, we can no, create- No, I, I hear you. I, I don't disagree with you. I am remembering though, that when I was in college, 30 years ago, I went to a small liberal arts college. I mean, it was Mm -hmm. smaller than my high school, largely white, affluent, Mm -hmm. but there were a handful of black students, Mm -hmm. many of them there on scholarships, Mm -hmm. and they clustered together. There, Mm -hmm. by and large, obviously not everybody, but by and large, there was very little interaction between the black students and everyone else. Um, I mean, to the point where you would read like those college guides. Lisa Burnback, the brilliant author of the official Preppy Handbook, one of the greatest books about socioeconomic class signifiers of all time. Anyway, she wrote a college guide um, that was very informative, very amusing. You know, she rated all the different colleges and went around and visited them and talked about the cultures and them and talked about, you know, what SAT scores you needed to get in, et cetera. And she would um, routinely use the term self-segregate. So mm. she would say, well, this college, blacks, there are, there are black students, but they self-segregate. And that was a neutral term. And this was the late 80s. And it was absolutely true. And I will say, and I, and I, I have no small degree of actual shame about this. I, as a student in college, was incurious about the experiences of these black students who were on scholarship. Um, I, it never occurred to me to maybe try to have, have a friendship with one of them. I, it just did not cross my mind. Um, and I'm not saying that there were not scholarship students who were white, who were from you know very poor marginalized backgrounds who also felt very left out, but they were not self-segregating mm-hmm. because they were you know passing. They were kind of you know invisible in the, in the sea of rich white kids. Um, and so I do think that we've come a long way. The idea that anybody would uh, think about black students at a college in that way is unthinkable. I think that I don't. I don't agree. I think that uh, racial groups still self self segregate quite a bit. I mean, that was still my experience. I still saw but that. I, but, but I think that the gr- white students would have a much better. There would be no excuse for not thinking about the experience of those students. But who gives a shit? I mean, what is it? (laughs) So what? You know, like, I don't even, I I, I just feel like we have, uh, we we feel like everything needs to be everything. You know what I mean? Like, it's like the ACLU also needs to serve every other uh, mission, every other good thing that we need in society. Every institution needs to uh, think about constantly. But that's not how it works. And it cannot function like this. We cannot, we cannot move forward like this because what will actually happen is every institutional will collapse because you cannot have 20 missions. You need to have one. You can be good at that one. You cannot be good at two. You cannot be good at three. You definitely can't be good at 20. 
I am not convinced that white kids just being so uh, enriched by learning about my experience as a Pakistani woman matters so much that I would be willing to seriously hamper the 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 ability of academia to do what it's supposed to do. No, I hear you. And I'm you know, uh, what I'm saying is maybe like you maybe can have we could stop we can have the a little clock bit. right now. I'm just saying like are you See that but this this is I think this itch? is a problem. I think this is okay. I, I think this is actually part of the problem because we have to be able to say none of it. We have to be able to say zero. We have to be able to say no compromise. That Why? that that from so, a, so when it comes from to a the, strategy point of view, no, from from a from a from the perspective of let's say let's pick uh, freedom of speech, you know, it, as related to academic academic freedom. But let's just say freedom of speech. The second you start saying freedom of speech is very important and it is the most important value, right? And then and then you say, but also sometimes this other thing is more important. Then what you're saying is spe- freedom of speech is not the most important value. Like you're saying that some some something. Something can sometimes overrule freedom of speech. When you have when you have got started down that road, that other thing is just going to increase. You know, it's just going to give you. More, it's just going to have to say more and more. It, 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 you're just going to create more and more avenues for people to say, "Well, this is an exception to freedom of speech, and this is an exception to freedom of speech," and to just expand that, you know, um, that field. So we have this idea of like hate speech. What happens over time? what constitutes hate speech increases. Sensitivities of people increase. Now words are violence, you know? So, so now we have to be careful about grievous psychological harm that we're doing to people. Um, I think we should be able to say that the, in, in the ACLU, the most important thing is freedom of speech and our civil liberties. <laughs> Obviously the ACLU cannot do, do, do that, will not do that, doesn't care Did about Did you see that what anymore. they did this week? They, no. uh, they were, they were all up in arms because, um, a, a, a murderer was executed, um, on death row and, uh, that, that prisoner had become, a, you know, announced his transgender identity oh, at, no. at a certain point and, and was executed, oh, uh, without no. his preferred identity oh, no. recognized. No, and no, the ACLU was, going there. was just... Livid. Yeah, this is, the, this is the most important thing to them. But, but the, what has happened to the ACLU? The AP, ACLU lost its mission. It had a it had a core. It had a no. It, I mean, it's you don't when when you are part of an institution that has one mission, you're not saying that me as an individual, I only care about this one thing. You're saying this institution that I serve should only care about this one thing because that is how it functions best. That is how. We can serve this one issue best. And if you so want, you can participate in many institutions. So if I'm, a, I'm an academic, but I also care about racial justice, well, then maybe I volunteer in my free time at the local whatever center for restorative justice, whatever, you know, mm-hmm. like, there's a nonprofit that can be dedicated to that. And I spend my time in that institution. But there is a fundamental like the, the, lack of understanding of what an institution should be um, and a kind of restraint, you know, an understanding that you can't be 20 things at once in every mode of life, in every place and space in life. Um, but it has just really hampered our ability to do well on, you know, uh, in, in a number, in a number of fields. And yeah. we need to say no to all of it. We need to say that nothing that the, the university system needs to be needs to care about knowledge seeking and the truth and that is what it cares about more than anything and it can have other values if it wants but those are always number 2 always and when the two coincide the university system chooses truth the university system chooses knowledge seeking like free and open inquiry that's what the university system chooses that's what that's the way it has to be. You have to be able to make those kinds of concessions. This is why I am very pessimistic because I don't think the average liberal is going to say this, even if they see a problem in the DEI system. They're going to have a very hard time saying, you know what, this is just not a top priority for the university. It might be priority number two or three or four or five, but it's not number one. Liberals are going to have a very hard time saying this because this is just like a big... Because they're going to lose their liberal... 
cred. I just think they can't say it. They just don't, they don't feel it. And they, they don't have that, like that fervor for any of these, you know, foundational values that, that got us to this point. Um, yeah. Uh, the, yeah. Maybe somebody know, needs to go and say it. I mean, it, it, it's, well, I it, mean, I'm thinking, I mean, you know, the Robert Zimmer at the university of Chicago was doing that for a while. Unfortunately yeah. he died. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm not as, I agree with you. I'm not as pessimistic as you are. I I'm pessimistic because I don't hear this often enough. I don't hear enough academics saying this. They need to not say that diversity is great. Um, but also we need to find a balance. They need to stop talking about balance. They need to stop saying the word compromise. They need to start acting like the activists who say no compromise, zero mm-hmm. compromise. They need to say they need to sound like them and talk but, like them. But then there's no nuance. So you're against nuance, nuance. in a university. I'm a, I am absolutely when it comes to a mission, when it comes to a mission statement of, say, a free speech organization, of course, I'm against nuance. Pick the thing, find a, what, what does nuance even mean? It just means, uh, it just means not having a single focus. It's mean, it means not understanding the purpose of what you set out to do or what you're setting out to do. Um, and I well, think, okay. I think our institutions all have different purposes. Those purposes are important and they need to focus on that purpose to the exclusion of all the other purpose of all the other, um, like missions that they could possibly serve. They need to serve them to the exclusion of them. That is the only way they can serve their individual missions and purposes well. And yeah. the way that we come together as a society is that we have a multitude of institutions, a multitude of organizations. They all serve different visions and missions and they all come together. We as individuals can be part of many and that is how we show what we care about. And that's fine. That needs to be accepted. It just cannot be the case that you know, the Museum of Fine Arts also needs to value racial justice. It just, it's a Museum of Fine Arts. Just leave it alone. Let it do its thing. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's absurd. But that's the Um, way, that's, that's the absurdity that is everywhere. I know. That's the absurdity that is everywhere. You know, um, we were talking with Ayla about woke dating apps, you know, and how, Mm -hmm. uh, all of the, the dating apps, they, they advertise themselves as kind of kink friendly and gender Mm. fluid friendly. Mm. Um, Another subway anecdote, I was noticing that match.com has a new subway campaign, ad campaign, and it's all about adults. It's it's the dating app for adults. And so they Mm. had something like, um, you know, find someone to lose lose track of time with with somebody who shows up on time, something Uh like that. And so like, you know, I think match.com has been always the very vanilla dating app. Uh-huh. But I thought it was interesting that they were obviously responding directly to the woke marketing. I think that's clever. Competing apps. That's clever to do. Yeah. The, you know, to, to to imply that they're not that without doing the conservative thing of like being really corny and cringy about it. You know. Um, right. No, they can't do that. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but but just saying like we're mature is yeah. Like it's, this it's is giving the a adults, similar message. Yeah. But I have. I. It makes me wonder if there, if sort of adulthood is going to come into vogue somehow. I mean, Mm. look, if the trad thing is a hip movement, maybe there's some kind of, I don't know, like mental version of that or something (laughs) like intellectual version of trad. Well, we see it. I mean, we see it with the heterodox crowd. We already have that. So yeah, we have that. Maybe. Yeah. Um, But I I don't know. I, I think. I, I mean, a free speech absolutist would say you can shout fire in a crowded theater, right? So, well, maybe, yeah. I mean, maybe they would say that, but I—that's I, a. At some point, we've got to get into that specific phrase and have like somebody from Fire or something come over and discuss it. <laughs> yeah. Well, they would say you should always there's shout interesting... fire. And, well, yes, but, but, the, but the, you know, I, I just feel like there's a lot of confusion going around. Um, you know, I, I led an organization for a long time. It was, I, I had a lot of pressure from a lot of different groups to expand our mission. 
to serve things that we were not that we were not founded on serving. And I knew mm. that our mission was hard enough to tackle as it was without tacking on a bunch of other things that we could also not tackle <laughs> if we had only focused on them. Um, I knew that we had to learn to do, be be good at the one thing that, you know, uh, that we knew well. Um, and that was that was our only shot at success. And I had, I mean, I had just had a lot of pressure to expand and to do that, that scope creep. Um, and like what I kinds know, of things? Well, just so that you start to care about more things other than the one rights based, you know, uh, rights f- uh, focus that you had, like also do LGBT and also do, you know, uh, yeah. racial justice and also do this because everything is, everything is the same. Like, every, uh, like uh, you've heard this time, uh, I hear this time and time again from progressive activists who say like, if you're, you know, you can't be a feminist if you support, don't support Palestine or whatever, right? Like there's all these, you can't be this other group if you don't support like a completely separate other movement because in their minds are all linked. Um, So I think there's a, there's this progressive tendency to flatten all the different progressive causes into one thing and that you cannot be a good ally to one if you are not also the best ally to the other. Yeah. And that attitude is being adopted within institutions that the only way to be a true free speech organization is also to be a racial justice organization, which is ludicrous and totally idiotic and self-defeating. And it's what we're seeing anyway. It's what we're seeing happen. I hope, I think, I think what I do see hope in is, you know, what the ACLU's collapse, you know, that was, this was an opportunity for um, FIRE, the foundation of what uh, you, they used to be individual rights and education. And now right. they are the fine foundation of indiv- I forget individual rights and expression. Yes. Maybe. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. I think you're right. Yes. Um, and th- so, so there was an opening for a true, you know, mission oriented free speech organization to pop up, which is wonderful. And maybe that's what will have to happen that we will have to replace some of these older institutions with more mission oriented institutions they will have a tough hill to climb up but i think it's it might be the only way to to climb up frankly so anyway with that we've been talking for a long time the hill so we, we should climb. Go are into, you are you quoting amanda gorman uh who's, no i'm not the hill who's, we climb no i was banned well, best I, thing that I can happen to an author remember. right yeah yeah i, I would i would coordinate books. it if i could like oh, you yeah. know if you if i was like a pr like mastermind, I would, I would find a way to do that. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, Hey, we didn't talk about Elizabeth Gilbert, right? When we finished recording last week, the news broke that Elizabeth Gilbert had uh, withdrawn her own book because of protests from Ukrainian readers. Okay, let's, it was um, set in, uh, let's talk about that in the bonus. Yeah, we'll talk about that. But uh, we'll yes, but some bonus. people speculated that that was a, uh, an elaborate publicity stunt. Ah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, Okay. okay. Well, let's well, let's go to the bonus and thank you to everyone that's been here with us so far. Yes. Thank you. All right. We'll see you next week. Next week. Bye.